Okay, uh, good afternoon and uh, also good day. And uh, so we're going to start our CCG Global Dialogue. And uh, since 2021, we actually uh, made uh, almost uh, uh, 100 dialogues with different uh, global opinion leaders and uh, uh, great uh, global thinkers. And, and Graham Allison has been twice on our global <laughs> CCG Global Dialogue. So we are very pleased again today we, we come uh, uh, to CCG and have another occasion uh, to have a global dialogue with uh, Professor Graham Allison on the occasion of this new book, uh, Escaping, Escaping uh, uh, He Hid His Trap, uh, uh, my dialogue with Graham Allison. So, so it's really uh, fascinating. And also, of course, I mean, uh, uh, Graham, uh, we, we probably need another uh, uh, more introduction uh, for our present uh, audience, but I think for the online audience, I just want to introduce him again. And uh, uh, Graham, Professor Graham Madison uh, is the uh, Douglas Dillon Professor of the Government at Harvard uh, Kennedy School, and uh, he's the founding dean of Harvard Kennedy School, which is, uh, which is a visionary uh, for doing that, and he's former director of Belfast Center for Science and International Affairs. And also, Professor Graham Madison has served as a key position uh, in the government of the U.S., including the Assistant Secretary of Defense in the Clinton administration, and also Special Advisor of Defense uh, of Secretary of Defense under the President Reagan. So he has also continues to advise in the government. And 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 of course, Professor is uh, Graham Madison is a great friend of China, and he has been traveled many times to China. Has actually been to CCG and I. Recently, being able to uh, uh, you know walk and talk with uh, Professor Graham Madison for for the last decade uh, and more, and just recently we we met almost every month. We met in uh, Davos in the Munich Security Conference. Now March now at CCG. So today we're going to talk about this book. Uh, uh, you know, Professor Allison is a famous work, uh, Destined for War: Can America and China Escape He Hit His Trap. That book was published in, in 2017. And so his, his view has generated an enormous uh, uh, global attention and global uh, debate, but also a global awareness of how, 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 how you know, dangerous you know, could be if we uh, did not follow the, uh, the right path of uh, avoiding this, uh, this conflict. So, so, so we have published this book, you know, largely based on our dialogues, but also uh, many uh, thought uh, that uh, Graham has published uh, recently, and the interviews and articles uh, that he has. So, uh, so the book is actually to introduce, uh, you know, how we can find ways to escape the, the trap, and uh, and also we published that in both Chinese and English. And today is the occasion that we had uh, published for the both editions, which is great. We thank uh, uh, you know Macmillan, uh, Powergrave, and also Citic Press. Uh, for collaborating on, on this uh, great book, uh, so 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 Graham, now we we probably we 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 come to you and uh, uh, you know uh, in your presentation just now in your uh, uh, presentation on, on the slides you, you talk about uh, competition corpor corporation and also you you give the uh, assignment for all of us to do. I mean we hope we will do that. Uh, so. We are now living in a very different uh, world now, and uh, of course we are living in a nuclear age. And uh, I remember last time when we when we talked with each other, uh, you mentioned that you know this is uh, is very dangerous if we are not careful. If we have a uh, you know getting in, 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 into the hot war, uh, Boston will be gone, Beijing will be gone, and Washington will be gone. <laughs> that that's you know you are famous for uh, for your thesis on the Cuba. Uh, a crisis, also a nuclear crisis at that time, but but we are probably uh, in that kind of a, you know in, in a nuclear, we're still in the nuclear age, and we're currently having two war. So 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 this uh, you know it's more significant now to 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 escape the history trap. So given the uh, contemporary con uh, conditions, and uh, of course uh, uh, a lot of people also said that maybe. We talk about the Hijizi trap. Uh, are we going to talk us into the self-fulfilling prophecy on that? <laughs> but, but you know, seriously, uh, how can we make people more aware of this? And maybe what are the uh, uh, really risks that are facing us? I mean, we have to. We are particularly on this Ukraine, uh, you know, war 
and and uh, and also uh, you know Gaza war going on and so how do you see the war today and are we at the brink of a third world war now so I mean Houthi's trap is 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 really getting close now uh, so how can we assess the global situation and uh, you know avoid the Houthi's trap so Graham please oh thank you is this this one? Good. So, uh, again, thank you, Henry and CCG, for such a good job in producing the book. Uh, and I thank you. Uh, uh, I was surprised when reading through it how coherent you had made uh, the answers to the questions. So uh, I, uh, I appreciate that. Uh, Chinese, I, again, I don't know enough about the current, I know, I know many Chinese very well, but I don't know in the broad uh, sweep uh, how many Chinese have a much appreciation of history. In the U.S., it's often said we live in the United States of amnesia. So people think if something didn't happen in my lifetime, it couldn't happen. So if you say, well, you know, there could be a war. No, no, war is obsolete. How about a, a real war in Europe? Most Europeans couldn't believe it until all of a sudden they find Putin invading Ukraine. And now, as you saw at Munich, there's this kind of wake-up clock going on across Europe as people think, oh, my God, there really are uh, tanks and planes and, and missiles and they're exploding and killing people and destroying. So again, the idea of a great power war seems the most, I mean, when I talk to students at Harvard, oh, that, that couldn't happen. It hasn't happened in my lifetime, as if that was <laughs> dispositive. Or it hasn't happened even in my parents' lifetime. Hmm? So that means it couldn't happen? No, absolutely not. Well, how about nuclear weapons and the use of nuclear weapons? That must be obsolete, or that's forbidden. It was taboo. Taboos are never broken. So I would say it's very hard to get people to think seriously about what are clearly real undeniable risks in the international security environment. So was it a real serious threat when Putin began talking about conducting tactical nuclear weapon strikes on Ukraine back in October, November 2022, after the invasion, but then once it stalled, the American intelligence community concluded the chance was about 50-50. Do it again. It's about a 50% chance that Putin would have conducted nuclear strikes. The Chinese intelligence community, I don't know what they concluded, but in any case, as they thought about this, uh, uh, in a collaborative action between both the U.S. and China, uh, Xi Jinping then issued a public warning uh, saying, we oppose any threat or use of nuclear weapons. Uh, and before he made such a public statement, this was when uh, Chancellor Schultz was here in November of 22. Uh, he obviously called Putin, with whom he has a very close relationship, and said, I've thought about this. I think this is not a good idea. Not a good idea for China. And my wish list, working with the U.S. government on the side, the thing I wished for most was that China would suggest to Putin why this was a bad idea. So that's another interesting example of how certainly thoughtful, serious leaders are taking seriously the possibility that one thing could lead to the other, that would lead to a war, even a great power war. Second example, just to, uh, so. The fact that Biden and she met in San Francisco took out in the midst of a campaign 
in which there's obviously no political advantage to being friendly to China. Indeed, there's every political advantage for who can bash China more dramatically. Uh, that Biden took out a long day to spend with Xi Jinping in which they would talk privately about what they really thought mattered. And that included war, Taiwan, AI, climate, uh, the overall relationship. We don't know even all the topics. We certainly don't know what they said to each other. Again, I regard that as great. If you're going to have serious relations between countries, you have to have private, candid, uh, uh, secure conversations between them, starting with the leaders. And, but if I now watch and see what happened since that meeting, you can infer a little bit about the conversation. So we've been through a very rocky period over Taiwan with the elections and the election of a new president who has many inclinations towards trying to declare a more independent Taiwan. But if I watch the behavior of both the Chinese government and the American government, it's been very restrained, almost as if it had been choreographed a little bit. Well, I usually try to read the tea leaves and see what, you know, what's to interpret. I interpret from that again that we had two leaders, thought seriously about the problem, worked their way through it. So I, I would say I worry a lot about the ways in which misunderstandings, misperceptions, miscalculations, and some third party's provocation could end up dragging people to a place they don't want to go. And that's why, again, I think it's been so important that the biden she conversations have continued. And then what's followed from that was similar conversations among trusted agents on both sides, including now these working groups. So I'm feeling somewhat more optimistic about uh, the situation currently. I'm sorry, that's a long answer. No, that, that's it's great. A complicated uh, question. You have a very good uh, uh, vision and also answer to the current uh, crisis we're facing, but also how important China, you as uh, uh, top leaders talk to each other and, of course, uh, getting uh, you know, on the same wavelength in terms of uh, you know, uh, how to co cooperate. Uh, one, one thing I'd like to follow a bit further, you, you actually mentioned in, in, in that uh, list that you uh, ask everybody to, to think about. I, mean, I think it's a great uh, list, uh, incentive to cooperate. Uh, I, I think that, uh, for example, we, we, we are living in the Really, in the intertwined world, as person she said, uh, you are in us, we are in you. You know, <laughs> I mean, we, we cannot uh, separate. But. So I, I'm thinking now is that the current global order, a current situation is that there's there's no more uh, common objective or common interest to 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 bind uh, all the parties to talk to each other. And you remember we had the Munich Security Conference for three times in a row, which you published, you participated. We talk about climate change. So the climate change is probably you know, threat number one facing mankind. And then we have a pandemic, we just, just finished. We haven't cooperated. And, and that has a big casualties uh, uh, for, for all of us. And uh, of course, uh, uh, we, we, we are having the digital world now. We are having AI, we are having all those things. Uh, so do you think, how can we get a better cooperation? Maybe should we have a new uh, international mechanism a multilateral system, or maybe now we're talking about multipolar world, but yet there's no multipolar system uh, to support that. So in order to create a more incentive to cooperative, uh, what we should do more, or what we can uh, you know, work on, on those things, and particularly US and China as two, and plus you as the three largest economy in the world, like we were just said in Munich last month, three largest economy, three largest uh, uh, you know, uh, in polit political influence, they, they should take some examples to work together so that uh, we don't talk about the differences. Let's talk about similarities and the common challenges. What do you think? No, I, yeah. I agree. Yeah. I, I, I'd say that uh, uh, I think the reason for uh, 
working through this exercise of both what are the reasons why I'm going to be a fierce competitor, but then also the same list or the list on the backside, what are the reasons why I'm going to be a serious cooperator or serious partner, is to start with our interests. Because I think, uh, uh, and when I start down my hierarchy of interests, the core interest of each state or the leader of each state is to ensure the survival of this state. So if my survival depends on your survival, I mean, if really I am in you and you are in me, I've used the analogy in America, there's a, we call it, inseparable conjoined Siamese twins. So imagine two human beings, which just happens in nature from time to time, are born, and Henry and I have the same GI system. Two heads, two, two hands, two brains, but literally joined and inseparably. So if that's true, however frustrating my behavior is, however dangerous I'm behaving, however deserving I am to be strangled, when you think about it, you think, if I strangle them, I may have a moment of satisfaction, but then I will have committed suicide. Well, that's a pretty powerful reason not to do that, to find some way to cooperate. So I would say I work down the interests. First, no great war, especially no nuclear war, because at the end of that, Everything's destroyed. And I look, climate, just what you said. So if either of us can make the climate uninhabitable for both of us, you and I have to find some way to cooperate in constraining them. And it's not only the two. We just happen to be the two most important economies and two most important societies. Obviously, we have to take some account of the other. I go down the list. How about the financial system? The financial system today is so entangled that in 2008, when Wall Street created a financial crisis that produced the Great Recession in the U.S., the world was teetering on the edge of a Great Depression. And why was that avoided? Because cooperation between U.S. and China had a joint stimulus, each a huge stimulus. And Hank Paulson, who was at the Secretary of Treasury at the time and who was the principal actor on the American side, has said frequently that he thought the Chinese action was at least as important as, important as the American stimulus. So again, a Great Depression would not be the end of the world. It was not as bad as the nuclear war. The Great Depression is pretty terrible. And if you remember the Great Depression of the 1930s, that provided the environment in which emerged Nazism and fascism and the forces that ended up leading to World War II. So again, there's one. Now, pandemics, you said. Excuse me, if a virus like COVID emerges somewhere, and it will again, for sure, The impact on all the societies is real. The interest, therefore, in having early identification in the COVID story, the Chinese uh, scientists published the, a genome, a sequence, with, I, I think, in six days or something. That was necessary for the story of the creation of the, of the vaccines. Again, that was not sufficient cooperation in my view. But I think if we work down that list, we have a lot of reasons for thinking that the countries can cooperate. But I think that in the world in which things are either or or black and white, that doesn't quite work, which is why I think it's so important that we 
realize the complexity of the situation and find our ways to some conceptualization that doesn't deny that it's going to be fiercely rivalrous on one hand and uh, deeply uh, cooperative on the other. Thank you. Thank you, Graham. Excellent. You, you have these uh, uh, vivid examples. Uh, particularly, you mentioned uh, Hank Paulson that uh, while he was a uh, treasury, uh, you know, financial secretary, and then while we have this 208 financial crisis, we 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 actually work together. I mean, that's how the G20 got uh, it's established, Absolutely. and uh, and China, U.S. China has a four trillion stimulus packages, which is uh, even China has a bit problem. Uh, China continue even uh, also during the uh, you know early uh, Asian financial crisis, China didn't devalue RMB. So uh, absolutely, we are we are in the same boat. You know, 190 country like person she said, <laughs> we are in the same boat. Uh, we we sink and float together. So uh, so we have to work with each other. Now, given the time, I have a last question before we open to the to our journalist friends. Uh, I, I, I received uh, you know your, your article when you sent it to me, uh, published on the Foreign Affair with uh, Henry Kissinger, uh, his last uh, piece of uh, um, uh, great article, uh, co-author with you, and actually that was also uh, published be between before the San Francisco President Xi and President Biden summit. So so you and Kissinger are very visionary. Uh, to propose this uh, AI cooperation, you know, it can be a double-edged sword. This AI, so, so, uh, so, so, of course, I mean, what's your advice now for the future? I mean, that has been already brought into the attention of the both governments to talk about. But maybe the world should pay more attention. Also, I really appreciate you mentioned about Kissinger also during your presentation. Now, prison. You know, Dr. Henry Kissinger has passed away. Where's the new Kissinger? You know, we we look at you and others, Hank Paulson, maybe others, to really to steer through the Sino-U.S. relation more constant, constructive national voices. So, so uh, we are really appreciative that you and Kissinger made this AI aware of of the governments between China and U.S. particularly, and I hope that you know we can continue to identify the risk and and propose all those constructive proposal in the future. So maybe your last uh, answer for, 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 for the discussion. Well, thank you. I, I uh, as I mentioned, I first became a student of Henry Kissinger's uh, way before most of the people here were born. I, I enrolled in this class when I was a graduate student at Harvard in 1965. And I, it was the joke was when for Henry's birthday, his 100th birthday, there were several parties, and people would occasionally, you know, then people give toasts and so forth. And I was often introduced as, he was introduced as the longest suffering, continuing education professor at Harvard with the slowest learner <laughs> in continuing education. And I said, that I was proud of that, that I continued learning from him all those all those years, and I never, never had any encounter with him that I didn't learn a lot. And then we became colleagues and friends, and even co-authors, as you said. Uh, so he had become obsessed by uh, AI as a new phenomenon that he thought would be as challenging for society as nuclear weapons had been when he was a young person working on these topics. And he knew that they were very different. He also knew that when he became interested in this, he was about 95 years old. When he told me he was going to do this, I said to him, Henry, don't think about this. You have enough things to think about, enough things. To, you know, this is a whole new arena. He said, no, I'm thinking about it. Fortunately, Eric Schmidt, the guy who had been the uh, chief executive of Google and who had been interested in AI, agreed to become like a tutor for both Henry and me. And so we learned a lot, but still about a millimeter deep, not, not very deep. Uh, but nonetheless, I think he rightly identified the possibilities of applications of AI that could have seriously catastrophic consequences for not only each society, but for mankind. And so how to put your 
head around that. Uh, well, uh, the article struggles with that and it suggests that on the one hand, it's attempting to say this is impossible. I mean, uh, never has is, never is the technology advanced at such a rate as AI is currently advancing. I had lunch today with one of the AI leaders here in, uh, in China and trying to understand how he sees what's happening. But certainly if you look in the American story, companies are doing everything they can to jump ahead of the other one. Uh, so uh, it, this is different from nuclear, but nonetheless, if you go back 80 years, when nuclear weapons were first introduced, the question of what was going to happen and how and whether they could be controlled and whether there was going to be nuclear Armageddon and whether that could kill it, all those were the same, similar questions. And lo and behold, as a result of uh, strategic imagination, statecraft, stick to itiveness, over the last 78 years, we've not seen a single nuclear weapon used in war. It's an amazing accomplishment. Not a fixed job, not fixed, it's not completed, but an amazing uh, work in progress. And there's not been a great power war. Again, historically unprecedented. So I think trying to reflect on lessons learned in that story, both for inspiration and for insights, is what the article challenges us to do. Now, fortunately, uh, Xi Jinping had been interested in AI already for a long time. And so he and Henry had talked about this a couple of times earlier. And so they had a very serious conversation about it in the visit in August. And then that informed this piece that we wrote and helped nudge the meeting that occurred. And it seems to me that in that meeting and the conversations, they were clearly two serious leaders who take the challenge seriously. They agreed then to encourage early conversations both between some of their trusted agents, because obviously in China, the Chinese government is trying to make sure that in the development of AI, there are no rogue actors applying this in a way that could have catastrophic consequences for China. And in the US, the US government is trying to do the same thing. So obviously we have some interest in this, talking about what are you doing and what am I doing and what works and what doesn't work. In the nuclear arena, uh, even though the US and the Soviet Union at the time were the superpowers, and they were deadly adversaries, they could agree that it would be better that there were not more nuclear weapon states. So basically, the non-proliferation regime limited the number of new nuclear weapon states to prevent a world nuclear anarchy. Well, today, there are two AI superpowers. Could they slow the development of AI or the, or the proliferation of AI, especially uh, large language models that could have the most dangerous application? Maybe, maybe. That would be difficult, but not impossible. So it seems to me that this is a topic that needs to be pushed ahead in the conversations, and there will be, as there already are, some track two conversations. There'll be academics are working on it in both uh, China and I was at uh, Xinhua this morning and Sui Lan, who's there, has been part of these conversations. So I would suspect that's the path ahead and if the, if the nuclear analogy is, is helpful, uh, in the early conversations between the parties, they were very exploratory. They, it didn't lead to any particular conclusions, they helped each other see how each was seeing it, uh, to understand the vocabulary, 
to see what ideas they had. So I would say that's uh, at least I would hope to, you know, what I would see going forward. Okay. Uh, great. I think uh, uh, this is really a, a visionary. I think that, uh, uh, you know, you and Henry Kissinger proposed this uh, AI concept. And also I'm glad that, uh, uh, you know, uh, President Xi, President Biden talked about that. And President Xi also talked to Henry Kissinger, uh, as you, uh, uh, you know, mentioned. So this is really uh, getting attention of the world. And if U.S. and China can collaborate on that to prevent uh, uh, the, the 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 you know the damage side on you know, the side effect of AI we we will probably in a better and and safe world so so thank you you know we hope that uh, you will carry on kissing your spirit <laughs> and be a uh, a great uh, uh, you know um, uh, you know supporter and promoter and of course uh, 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 a great uh, uh, contributor to the uh, American China relations so I think we probably uh, conclude the, the 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 dialogue part. Which is a, a dialogue about our new book, uh, uh, the, how to he, escape he, this trap. That Professor Graham Allison uh, joined this uh, CCG uh, book launching event. Uh, I, I'm, I'm Henry Wang. I'm the founder and president of Center for China Globalization, and thank all of you for coming. And uh, before I, I leave, I would like to. I, I know you probably talk about Henry Kissinger's birthday. You have a birthday tomorrow. Let's <laughs> I hope we have a panda uh, gift for you and. Uh, so, so we just give it to to show our appreciation for coming to CCG. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Looking forward to the pandas returning. That's right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Have some Q and, from, from, from. and thank you so much for uh, the very fantastic dialogue between Professor Allison and Dr. Wang. And right now, the floor is open to the questions. We would like to take questions from our media. Today, there are so many international media and domestic media would like to ask questions. So um, maybe I know um, the question from uh, yeah, uh, Yuan Tan Tian from uh, CNG, from CCTV. Uh, hello, Dr. Grime. I'm the reporter from China Media Group. Uh, I noticed that recently the U.S. House of Representatives passed the uh, TikTok deserative bill, and the, ch the U.S. government also uh, continued to uh, restrict the the Chinese technology industry, uh, which also influenced the new new energy vehicles. So, how do you think of uh, the competition between the Chinese and the U.S. government? And the next question is, um, what do you think of what can be done to avoid this this kind of the suicide tribe? So, thank you. Maybe it's first. So, uh, yeah. Sorry. Uh, so, uh, in the technology arena, we should expect the rivalry to become uh, more intense. And uh, one sees that in part in the attempt by the U.S. to constrain the uh, exports of the most advanced semiconductors, which is already having some impact on the development of AI uh, here in China. Uh, and uh, that's because in many arenas, the U.S. and China will be fierce rivals, each attempting to be ahead of the other as far as it can be. So I would say that's part of the rivalry part that's inevitable almost. In the EV space, or in the green technologies, uh, it's even going to be more interesting because uh, basically, uh, thanks to its own uh, industrial policy and the innovation and, uh, and operations of its own companies, 
China now essentially owns everything green and clean. So I wrote a piece actually, I don't think it's in this book, but mm -hmm. you know, it was after, called uh, America's Green Future mm -hmm. Will Be Red. Uh, if you look at every green technology, China produces 70% of it, 80% of it. If you look at the inputs to it, China produces 70% of it or 80% of it. Mm -hmm. So take, for example, solar panels. Last year, China installed more solar panels in China than the U.S. has installed in the U.S. in the whole 25 years in which the U.S. has been installing solar panels. So absolutely amazing. And actually, what China did last year in renewable technologies was such a great leap forward that it's quite likely that in a, as opposed to the target, which had been a uh, peak uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions by 2030, that goal may be met by 2025, maybe even, maybe even sooner, maybe even this year, conceivably. So that capability is great for the world. I mean, basically, Chinese solar panels are 70% cheaper than anybody else's. Mm -hmm. And therefore, the more they're used globally, the more this will produce uh, energy without greenhouse gases, the better that is for the biosphere. That's on the one hand. On the other hand, if you're a company, let's take, for example, in the US, an auto company, or in Germany, an auto company, and uh, BYD wants to sell uh, its EVs in the US or Europe. Well, excuse me. I mean, you can buy a BYD entry level car, I think it's Seagull, for less than $10,000 here in China. And what's the cheapest uh, EV in the US? It costs about Twenty-seven, twenty-eight thousand dollars. So China, when it mass produces or scale produces manufactured product, has an ecosystem that's basically dominant. But the impact of that on other nations' economies and companies and unions will lead to a lot of pushback. So I would say that's another arena where there's these balance and trade-offs. So I'm looking for or expecting a future in which there'll be very fierce competition and constraints and debates and discussion. We'll probably even, in the same way that there's a good book that was published this year called uh, Chip Wars, there'll be another book called uh, EV Wars or Green Wars or Tech Wars or where there'll be uh, competition and rivalry, and that'll have to be balanced. I mean, you, you would like to say, well, let's just get over it. We're not going to get over it. It's going to be a struggle. But you need it to be balanced by the recognition that at the same time we're rivals, we're also interdependent partners. So I, I would say that's my bet about the likely future. Okay, thank you. Maybe another question from uh, Phoenix TV. Uh, thank you, Professor Allison. Um, my name is Emily from Phoenix TV. Uh, we, we noticed the U.S. Ambassador Nicholas Burns has recently described the relationship between China and the U.S. as a battle of ideas. But we also know the U.S. scholar Mearsheimer has long warned these kind of ideological claims is a great illusion of the US. So I'm just wondering, what do you think? What, what eventually are the two countries competing about? And also, second question is, what do you think is going to happen if um, former President Donald Trump takes office again? <laughs> Thank you. Another easy question, yes. <laughs> so two very different questions. So the battle of ideas, or the ideological conflict, or the systems conflict uh, is complicated and easily gets 
is too, too, too frequently oversimplified. Uh, President Biden describes it as the a battle between uh, democracy and autocracy. Uh, and uh, again, I don't think that quite captures the, mm -hmm. you know, the, it's a, 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 sim a simplification. Uh, but I think there is ultimately a battle of ideas about how to organize and govern a society. So Xi Jinping believes that a uh, that, that governing a complex society like China requires a party-led, I would put it in my terms, autocracy or, uh, or more authoritative system in which the party as basically the leadership vanguard plays a critical role in leading the society in order to create sufficient order in order to have a successful society. And that story is playing out. And if you look at the story of China's spectacular growth over the past generation or two, it's been pretty impressive. It can, nobody can deny it. The American story is a different story. So whereas Chinese put order, or at least the Xi Jinping leadership, and Chinese tradition puts order as kind of the central political idea, American society has been built on a different idea that puts liberty, individual liberty, as the central idea. And the American Declaration of Independence declares universally that, quote, all human beings are created with endowed rights by their creator to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So that means everybody, Hong Kongese, Taiwanese, Chinese, Indians, Africans, everybody. And uh, that means that, and, and Americans have been historically pretty persistent in trying to promote those ideas even though they have been struggling to realize them at home. So that's been a struggle within, within the society. So I think there, that in fact there are competing ideas there. My uh, resolution or my suggestion about that is that as long as the U.S. and China compete peacefully in a world in which they're coexisting, each to show which model can better govern our society and better produce what people want, that seems to me to be a reasonable, a reasonable issue. And whether, uh, given the complexities of the 21st century a, and, uh, and the absolute overload of information and misinformation with social technologies and uh, all the various media, whether a society like the U.S. can actually remain unified or ends up becoming so sharply divided or can function successfully as opposed to being dysfunctional, which our government has certainly been recently. Or, on the other hand, whether the Chinese system falls victim to the traditional uh, weaknesses and failures of an autocracy because it becomes more uh, insecure, becomes more controlling, it becomes more cautious, and therefore more limiting of the imagination and innovation that comes from a more open and freer society. Well, we'll see. So my suggestion about this has always been we should let the experiment play out. In 10 years, 20 years, 50 years, it may turn out that everybody agrees to be governed, it needs to be more like this. And it may be that 50 years from now, or 20 years, everybody agrees it needs to be more like that. So it's a, I'm sorry, that's not a very uh, concise answer, but that's my, 
on Trump, another big, a big uh, wild card. So for most of you, you probably are having trouble believing that Donald Trump would be the nominee for uh, the re Republican Party for election in 2024. Certainly most Americans have been very slow to wake up to the fact. Henry and I mentioned it, or Henry mentioned it, uh, or we were all at Davos, yeah. or really, sorry, at, uh, yeah, both Davos and, yeah, yeah. and uh, Munich. Mm -hmm. And the elephant in the room was this idea that, <laughs> wait a minute, is Trump real? Could this be happening? Is this America? What, what the hell is going on? Okay. Yeah. It was basically the question over and over. And I would say, yes, it's real. Uh, Trump will be the Republican nominee. Uh, if the election were held today, uh, it's essentially a toss-up. Uh, he's actually slightly ahead in most of the swing states. So if he should return to office, then I think this will be a very different relationship. And I think we saw the first uh, installment of that in his first term, but in his, in the first term, you had a president who hadn't really figured out how government worked and had in the government many people who came from, uh, who were traditional uh, American foreign policy uh, types like say Jim Mattis, the Secretary of Defense, whom Trump found frustrated him because he would want something to happen, but since he had, Trump hadn't figured out how to cause it to happen, the system resisted him. I think this time, he would be likely to have lieutenants that would be lo more loyal and would be able to do more of the things that he intended to do. And so I would say, again, if Thucydides were watching, he would say the uh, uh, stay tuned. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, any other questions for media? Yes, please. You can introduce which media you're from. Uh, thank you, Professor Allison. Uh, I'm from the Beijing News. Uh, I have a question also about the U.S. elections. Uh, so, what's your anticipation for the relations between China and the United States in the year of 2024? As we all know that uh, the relations tend to be much more fragile in the election election year than other normal years. And uh, you just uh, share your view on what would happen if uh, former President Donald Trump was re-elected. So, what would happen if President Biden uh, was re-elected. Would there be some more positive policies toward China since he's already had four years uh, in office? Thank you. Very good questions, thank you. So that gives me actually an opportunity to say something that I, I wanted to say. So let me uh, be precise here. So I've said to several people already I want to apologize as an American for what you're likely to see in the year ahead. The U.S. has entered what Americans call our silly season, in which case the hyperbole that's so common in political discourse already becomes so extreme that the connection between what comes out of politicians' mouths, and reality is almost disconnected. And unfortunately, that's true for both candidates or both campaigns. In the case of this 2024 campaign, one thing almost everybody can agree on is bashing China. Mm -hmm. So you're going to hear lots of terrible, nasty things said about China by the two candidates and by candidates for the Senate and by candidates for Congress. So you can hardly get in trouble in the U.S. for saying something nasty about China. The people seem to compete to see 
who can be tougher on China than the other guy. Uh, and what I say to Chinese colleagues in the government and outside, especially for people in the press, you have to remember this is Americans are strange and American campaigns are unusual. So Americans are people that engage in American football games in which two people who know each other well on opposite teams play for 60 minutes trying to crush the other person violently. And then at the end of the game, put their arms around each other and go have a beer. Mm. So when I, I have some Chinese students at Harvard, they said, this is crazy. You can't have one hand slapping someone and the other hand hugging them. And I said, normal people maybe don't do that, but Americans do. So it's a, it's a pretty strange behavior. So here's the one consolation in that picture. Uh, remember, however nasty anything is that's said by either candidate, Trump or Biden, each will say even nastier things about their American opponent. So I'm not trying to excuse this or justify it, but when you hear someone say something about Xi Jinping or China that you think, wait a minute, this is just over the top, watch and see what they say about their American opponent, it will be even more extreme. Again, I'm not trying to justify or I'm just trying to explain so we understand the context. And I'm sorry, I missed your second. Or... Oh, with Biden, yes. So let me go back to the point I made earlier. I think in the San Francisco meeting and in the, well, what the Chinese government calls the spirit of San Francisco that's followed, you get a pretty good picture of Biden and what he believes about the relationship between the U.S. and China. So he did not like the fact that the relationship was spiraling downwards. He began a mid-course correction after halfway through his term that began at Bali, where he and she had, a, again, a very good conversation. This is back in the fall of 20. 22. There was then the balloon incident that blew things off course for a bit, but which then was recovered in first the meetings between uh, Jake Sullivan and uh, Wang Yi, and then by Biden and she uh, and at San Francisco. So I, I believe their serious private candid conversation uh, was about building not a floor, as I said, but a foundation for a stable, sustainable relationship going forward that'll have a big chunk of competition and rivalry, but a big chunk of cooperation and partnership. And I think they're each both struggling and their governments are struggling to find ways to articulate that, which is another reason why as Henry and I were talking earlier, I think this is an opportunity for people in the analytic community, both in China and in the U.S., to try to help appreciate that the reality does really require that both of these things are going to be happening at the same time. It's going to be very uncomfortable. It's going to be messy. But it's still... You know, Wu and Yue got to the shore, okay? If you're in me and I'm in you, I don't want to commit suicide. You don't want to commit suicide. So we're probably going to find a way to coexist. Okay. Uh, I, I believe there are a lot of questions will be raised, but uh, time is limited. Let me take the last question, please. From me there. From me there. Yeah. Maybe. Yes, please. Yes, sir. Introduce yourself firstly. And um, I'm Henry from Phoenix New, Phoenix New Media and colleague of Emily. 
So I also go to Munich Security Conference this year, and I'm very interested in Professor uh, Climate Might, uh, Mutual Assured uh, Destruction. I think it's a good concept, and it's, by, by, it's popular maybe in, uh, in part of elites, in the policy makers. But uh, maybe I think the populist, will, uh, especially the uh, climate uh, skeptics uh, like Donald Trump, uh, they, they would not buy it. So how to turn it, turn a wonderful concept into actions? Thank you. Well, thank you. I, I mean, I think first it'll help to have both in the analytic community and in the press discussion of what, what means climate mad. Most people don't quite get it. I think now, today, most people agree climate is a serious threat. Most people agree we need to take major actions uh, to deal with greenhouse gas emissions. But most people still haven't quite got to the point that John Kennedy got to after the Cuban Missile Crisis to say, wait a minute, we live on a very small planet. Here's this little teeny planet, and it's in an enclosed biosphere. And it's just a physical fact that my greenhouse gas emissions and yours go into the same biosphere. Doesn't really make much difference which one of us emitted the greenhouse gases. The impact is the same on both of us. And either of us could, on the previous trajectory, make the whole thing uninhabitable for both of us. So that would be crazy. So that's pretty powerful motivation. And I think, actually, the governments recognizing that motivation, and China, dramatically, have now taken seriously advancing the technologies that will allow human beings to meet their energy demands, which they're going to meet in one way or the other, by renewable alternatives that don't have such climate consequences. So I think this is an area in which it's not, I mean, I think there's general public recognition, but where one could make more uh, intelligible what the potential risks are and why, as I say frequently, China made a great leap forward for mankind in advancing green technologies at prices that could be affordable globally that will allow people to meet energy demands without or with, with fewer greenhouse gas emissions. And I would say the same thing in the U.S. So from the U.S. side, Biden certainly gets the idea and part of, substantial part of what his uh, Inflation Reduction Act is about is setting very ambitious uh, targets for greenhouse gas emissions and then trying to develop the technologies or try to, uh, to deploy the technologies that will make this possible. So that's the good news side of it. But as we go back to the earlier question, the bad news side is that each will care about whether China makes the technology advances or the U.S. does. Well, if it's made and both of us can use it, that's great. So I always say to people, suppose a vaccine or a medicine was invented in China that would help my wife who had a disease, you know, recover. Would I care? I would give thanks for whoever did it. So those are advances for mankind, but at the same time they have distributional consequences about which we will end up struggling. So I think, again, it's a, it's a great example where if my survival requires, well, that's pretty compelling, and that should constrain unreasonable competitive instincts. Uh, but I think the balance will be the will be the challenge for leadership, and I think in in uh, in Biden and Xi Jinping, we have leaders that understand that. 
Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Allison. I think it's a uh, fantastic and wonderful and provoking occasion uh, from uh, your ideas and this new book. And uh, everyone with the sheet just uh, uh, give us uh, the US China incentives to cooperate. I uh, feel those, all of those, yes. Yeah, a lot of answers. I think uh, we need a longer list for that cooperation, shorter list for competition. <laughs> So thank you all. As the time is limited, we have to end this uh, um, conversation. But uh, uh, all the media people, uh, if you are interested in having further communication, I think we can leave for a while. After maybe in a half hour, we have uh, another occasion to continue our interview. Thank you. Thank you, all of you. And thank you, audience. We know there are th um, hundreds, th thousands of uh, the audience online for today's live stream. Uh, it's a wonderful uh, event, I think, today, and a very uh, important occasion, I think, for uh, the remarkable history in, for the future. It's a future-driven event, I think. Thank you. Thank you, your great opinion, Professor. Thank you, all the participants. Thank you, Dr. Wang and the CCG team and our um, partner from uh, the presses, um, from uh, Springer Nature and the CETIC press. Thank you all. <laughs>